shakeup at City Hall. <laughs> Miami voters bring in the new. We did it. We've achieved something. Now the real work starts. Does the drama end or start a new chapter? The commissioners elect right here live. <laughs> Casino Royale Battle Royale. Six, eight, nine, and four and ten. Is sports betting online on the reservation? This case barely in the second quarter of a four quarter game. The Supreme Court may decide. <laughs> the Eagles have landed. They played impeccably throughout the entire parade. We're still dreaming, but it's a reality. Stoneman Douglas High in the national spotlight for all the right reasons. The big news this Thanksgiving weekend, all live this week in South Florida. And we begin with breaking news this morning, right here, a live look at Gaza. An Israeli Defense Force spokesperson is confirming the hostage release is underway. 14 Israeli citizens and three foreign nationals, one American among those, held hostage is now being handed over to the International Red Cross. Also CNN reporting that American is Abigail Eden. She just turned four years old on Friday. She is part of the release swap and apparently already in friendly hands this morning. It is evening now in Israel and in Gaza as we look at this live look at what appears to be a checkpoint crossing where that hostage swap is going to be uh, completed. Of course, we are also reporting on the other side of this swap, Palestinian prisoners being handed over, three prisoners for every one Israeli and one uh, foreign national held in Gaza. We will continue to monitor this breaking news right now all hour on this week in south florida and of course we are going to be bringing you any updates including these live pictures as much as we can that said good sunday morning to you i'm glenna milberg this many voters rocked miami's political universe this week replacing two-fifths of the city commission a potentially seismic change in the voting math and in priorities in a city weary of scandal Businessman Miguel Gabella will replace Alex Diaz de la Portilla, who is currently suspended after his arrest on corruption charges. And civil rights activist Damian Pardo will replace Sabina Covo, ousted after her first term. Days later on Thanksgiving, we connected with Miami's mayor, who also faces some scrutiny into his business relationships. He could hardly contain his optimism that the former commissioners who have hamstrung his efforts in the past in many ways may no longer have the numbers to do so. Look, I think it's always good when you have you know, fresh uh, perspective, fresh people. Uh, I get along with both of the candidates. I've known them for a long time. Um, they've been community activists for a long, long time. Have you spoken to them at all? I, I, I've texted with both of them. Uh, I spoke to them before the election, and I'm excited to work with them. I mean, what did the text say? Congratulations. <laughs> Both Miami Commissioners-elect Miguel Gabella and Damian Pardo are with us today. Uh, so happy to have you both, one right here in the studio, one on Zoom. Good morning. Pleasure to be here. Um, I want to start with Miguel Gabella on Zoom. I want to start with you. Um, you actually have not only fought a race here, this is your second time. This is kind of a rematch that you now have won against Alex Diaz de la Portilla, but you also had a fight, court fights over your residency, which you won. And uh, his outgoing parting shot, the former commissioner, Alex Diaz de la Portilla, filed again. How, what's the status of this new residency case for you? Uh, Glenna, first of all, thank you for the invitation. And I want to congratulate com uh, Commissioner-elect uh, Damian Pardo, uh, who I hope to work with uh, in the, in the, uh, in the commission, commission. But uh, look, this is more of the same that they've been doing for the, uh, the past months to try to, to uh, uh, Put obstacles in my candidacy, and now that I'm elect, they're doing the same thing. And basically, he's going to lose this uh, lawsuit, uh, and you know I, I will be uh, you know sworn in, and that's the end of that. So you're going full steam ahead, and I, I just want to point out that you both are commissioners elect and have not been sworn in yet, so we have no sunshine violations here, any potential sunshine violations. For the record, uh, Damian Pardo, District Two. You won this seat from Sabina Kova, who was in her first term. What do you think she did wrong that voters didn't reelect her? Well, I think voters actually expected a change. 
meaning that something was going to change uh, on the commission, or at least that there would be discussions about the corruption that was constantly in the headlines. And I think that's what they were looking for. That lack of change, I think, is what led to the acceptance of my candidacy and my campaign. And this was, I mean, all the way around, this was a really dirty, negative race. Um, I'm just going to go out there and say that hardly one in 10 Miami voters put you both in office. Miguel, what do you think of that voter turnout? Where was everybody? Look, they were turned off by all the negative campaigning. Um, it's, it, I think it's my job, our job, to bring uh, some uh, uh, belief again in our, our elected officials, and I'm going to attempt to do that as hard as I can. Uh, at the end of the day, the, the voters have, have spoken. Uh, I'm just going to follow their will. And I think it's a new day for, for Miami, and the past is the past, and uh, I will try to work with all the commissioners uh, on the the dais. Uh, but let there be no mistake, Glenna, there, there is corruption going on in the city of Miami, and that needs to be weeded out. Uh, you want to go there? You throw out a line like that? I'm going to ask you for details. Well, as, as you've known uh, during the, uh, the past last months and, and years, you know, uh, I feel that the, the city commission has been uh, incorrectly led not led, but let's say uh, council has not been adequately uh, been given uh, to so, uh, some of the commissioners uh, or all, uh, and we're in this lawsuit maze uh, of I don't know how many millions by the time this is said and done, and uh, I just want to put a stop to that, and uh, I think the city attorney needs to go. Um, I'm going to take that. There's a there's five votes on the commission. Um, City Attorney Victoria Mendez certainly is under scrutiny at the moment for what may be her part or not innocent and proven guilty in a uh, some business dealings that her husband has vis-a-vis -vis real estate from senior citizens sold at a profit. Just for anyone not following the in the weeds of Miami politics. Damian Pardo, do you agree? Does the city attorney, for either that reason or others, uh, should be gone? I do agree. I think you just mentioned the turnout issue. When we talk about turnout and lack of turnout, it's because voters and residents are just tired. You have a commissioner with a verdict that came down, two and a half million dollar legal bill. You have another one arrested you know, on the commission. Uh, investigations right and left, and they don't see other people talking about it on the dais. They don't see our government working for them, and that simply doesn't feel like a democracy. So they lose the will to vote. They, they feel like no matter what they do, nothing's going to change. That's why I think our election is so monumental, because it represents that hope and change momentum that we haven't seen in a long time. So you mentioned uh, the verdict. Also, Commissioner, uh, remaining Commissioner, uh, Joe Corroyo, was also very recently hit with a $63 million civil judgment uh, for essentially accused of using Miami's government as a weapon against his political opponents, in this case, businessmen who run uh, Southwest 8th Street businesses. So what do you do with a city staff who at least a civil jury feels is being used like that and and how for out of fear of retribution to speak to the actual people who work for the city well in my case i think there are a lot of good people that work for the city and i believe you lead by example and i think when there's a different message and a different tone in the city people are going to be relieved and people are going to flock to it and, and in, in some ways, I think that will become the new consensus and the new majority, hopefully. <laughs> Miguel, what do you think? I agree uh, wholeheartedly. I think uh, there's a sigh of relief right now with a lot of city employees because morale is low. And it's like uh, Damien says, you know, uh, we need to go in there and restore morale. And that, that starts at the top. I can't ask you to jump off the bridge if I'm not going to jump off the bridge myself first. And that's, that's for my part, that's what I intend to do in the, uh, the city of Miami. We have to bring some, some decency, some civility, uh, some, uh, you know, uh, business-like uh, atmosphere, you know, that the residents know that, that the work is being done on their behalf and not this, uh, you know, thing going on where, uh, you know, commissioners use the, the city attorney, for example, wasted tax dollars that uh, could have been used on projects, uh, you know, for our district to, to better the district, the infrastructure, so on and so forth. And I think at the end of the day, the, the voters, again, have spoken, and I think we have a clear mandate uh, to, uh, to do our job. 
So you are two of five. Um, that's a, a huge chunk, but certainly not a majority. Commissioner Manolo Reyes, who was an incumbent, resoundingly won his race. So there's another. You still have Commissioner Joe Corroyo, very popular in his district. Obviously, he keeps getting reelected. And Christine King, who is the chair this year, uh, makes up the fifth. Have you spoken to any of the other three yet about any issues? No, I have not. Miguel? Uh, I have I have not, uh, but I suspect uh, that uh, you know, uh, Manolo and uh, Manolo Reyes and uh, Commissioner King uh, are seeing the writing on the wall. Uh, they no longer have Mr. Portilla, uh, you know, to contend with and Carollo as a team. And so I think now the dynamic uh, changes, and I think some commissioners will realize this. And uh, this is just the reality of the situation. So um, what I want to do is we have a quick break, so we're going to take a quick break, but I want to get into some of Miami's biggest issues because some of Miami's biggest issues are all of South Florida's biggest issues, no matter what part you live in. So quick break, and we will, we will be back um, for a little bit, but what we want to do now is can we go to a live shot of Gaza right now? We can, and back at the checkpoint uh, here between Gaza and Israel, right at that checkpoint, hostages as we speak uh, being released underway. This is something we are continuing to watch via our network partners. Uh, information coming from the IDF mostly being vetted through our network partners, so stay with us. We will be right back. We are back with Miami's newest commissioners-elect, Damian Pardo and Miguel Gabella, for the very first conversation all together since the election, and I do appreciate that. So let's get into um, a couple of issues of South Florida, and one of them, as Damian Pardo reminded me of, was the influence of money, not only in elections, but in everything that happens. So Damian, let, let's take a look here. We've, we've already gotten, um, I'm just going to talk off the top of my head, there was this Rickenbacker Marina uh, and the lobbyist for the Rickenbacker Marina, Rickenbacker Marina project is already saying that Alex Diaz de la Portilla was trying to shake him down. There's a lawsuit now. Whether that's true or not, we don't know. But it just is one example of how money plays into what's being done in the city. How are you going to change that? Well, I would love to see campaign finance reform. I would love to see an independent body with the authority to investigate corruption charges, more disclosure, more transparency, I think is critical. And I actually think this is the first election where the voter started tying the undue influence of money with the consequences they experience, like traffic and flooding and the changing character of their neighborhood and the changing quality of life. So well, how do you, why do you say that? Because if that were true, wouldn't many more voters have voted? Well, the, the ones that were passionate and went out there, who I thank dearly, I mean, it, uh, this almost felt like a movement uh, at some points, made the biggest difference. And they clearly saw that connection. And as people talk and people learn more and more, I think this is going to be a bigger issue as we continue in Miami-Dade politics. Miguel Gabella, take, take that one. How, how do you get money out of politics? <laughs> as long as we're talking about that Rickenbacker deal, uh, the man we spoke about, Manny Priegas, who brought the suit, uh, was a big funder of your campaign. So, you know, how do you tell someone like that no if a no is warranted after getting that kind of funding? Sorry, man, I, I have a cold, and that's why I would love to have been in person with you guys at the studio, but I have a bad cold. Feel better. And we hope you feel better. I, I didn't want to expose you guys, but look, you got to look at my campaign. We had Alex de la Portilla spent $2 million against us, and what we had was $200,000. Granted that Manny Pregas, uh, yes, he was a, a big uh, uh, factor in this, uh, but the man I think is honest because of, uh, look at what he's doing with, uh, uh, with, the, uh, with the Rickenbacker uh, Marina. Uh, I, think he, well, I think what's going on here is that uh, we, the good guys, understand what's going on here and we want to change it uh, like uh, Commissioner Elect Pardo just said. You know, we, we, I think uh, I would be open to what uh, Commissioner Pardo was was uh, talking about, maybe do a, a think tank on that. Uh, there, there needs to be more uh, scrutiny, I think. Uh, you know, when you're up against, you know, Tommy, you know, you need money to run a campaign. At the end of the day, this is the fact of life. This is this is the reality. You know, and again, if you look at the two million dollars that 
that are put these spent against us with two hundred thousand dollars, you gotta you gotta wonder what all that money wants. Okay. And and so at the end of the day, I think there there needs to be some kind, at least some kind of campaign uh, reform. And and so you know that that's not a Miami problem, although maybe it's a more visible Miami problem just because Miami is gonna Miami. But Damian Pardo, when when somebody comes to you and says, "Listen, here's what I'm doing. I support you. Here's a check to show my good faith." Um, hey, can you do this for me? Because it, actually, Miami's mayor is actually being yeah. scrutinized for exactly that. What do you tell these people? Well, I come from a background that falls under the SEC and FINRA. It's highly, highly regulated. So there are very strong guardrails. And I would probably react the same way. I don't react well in those situations. That's my training. But that's exactly why I insist that we need those kinds of guardrails in the city of Miami, because then it becomes part of the culture and the culture starts changing. And it really just makes life easier for everyone, from employees to electeds to the residents and the voters. So what is your biggest issue? You know, housing, flooding uh, are two that just come to top of mind. What, what is your biggest issue? Damien, you go first. For me, it's definitely bringing back the services to the residents. That's what I ran on. The net offices were closed a couple of years ago. The commission budgets increased by about a million dollars. We need to decentralize our services. That's very important. Affordable housing is very important to me. I've worked a lot with it in the industry as a, as a banker at one point in my life. And I think that even beyond affordable housing, there's displaced residents that have specific needs that affordable housing simply doesn't, doesn't meet. So we really need to rethink what is happening. Our investment in affordable housing as a city is very low. So I would love to see us really make a commitment and really collaborate with the county and other players where we haven't in the past. So I think all of that's very important. And you're going to be operating under the new State Live Local Act, which, which could be beneficial or could be a real albatross, depending yeah. on how that plays out. Miguel Gabella, your, your biggest priority, day one, besides trying to oust the city attorney. <laughs> No, 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 listen, I'm good. look, um, I say about the city attorney because we're speaking about corruption. But Understood. at the end of the day, I'm 100%. Yeah, Understood. I'm going there with a positive message. And look, one of the main things uh, in our areas is the flooding issues, you know, and uh, we have to tackle that job. I have to tackle that job in my district because it's a big one. Among the, the services, I, I also ran on, you know, uh, that I was going to provide the services that were not given for the last four years. So it's very important to me uh, to, uh, to put the right people. Uh, in my office, for example, I have said to everybody that's going to work for me that uh, this is just not a job that, uh, you know, uh, you know, nine to five and th this you have to do your job here. We need to, you know, if I'm going to, uh, you know, go out and, and campaign on a, uh, you know, um, on a, on a uh, services uh, for the residents, uh, you know, platform, I, I have to make it a reality. And that's one of my priorities that the, that the residents know and restore the confidence that, that I am gonna be, you know, uh, holding everybody in my office accountable, including myself, uh, to the voter, to the, uh, to the, uh, to the taxpayer, uh, and we're gonna be getting things done. In the short time we have left, Damien, um, Miami's city commission meetings are sometimes jam-packed with people there just for what is the show. Yeah. And that's, um, that's not really a positive thing, is it? So what do you do to keep uh, decorum and professionalism at those meetings? Well, I think starting on time, bringing greater organization to the process, allowing people to speak to their line item when the line item comes up, as opposed to making everyone show up at 9.30 and speak to line items that aren't considered till later in the day. So I think there are a lot of issues for us to consider in that way. We all will be watching. I'm going to guess this is the last time we have you both together because once you're sworn in, that's a sunshine <laughs> violation. So I sure do appreciate you rocking and rolling on this Thanksgiving weekend. Great to have you both. Thank you, Glenna. Pleasure. Thank you very much, Lynn. Appreciate it. Thank you. And next, place your bets. The court fight over tribal gambling expansion is at the U.S. Supreme Court level, sort of. And it's all about online betting. And all of that is next. All right, back to breaking news just for a moment. There has been some action. We are looking live at the crossing between Gaza and Israel, where the hostages hostage exchange is taking place right now. Uh, I don't want to tell you I know who we're looking at, but it certainly does appear to be that these are people involved in exchanging what will be 17 hostages from Israel. 
Uh, 14 of them are Israeli, or three of them are um, foreign nationals, and we know at least one of those foreign nationals is a little American girl named Abigail Idan. She celebrated her fourth birthday as a hostage, as a captive. She is among those being released today. This release includes women and children, which means seven of the American men who were there, including uh, citizens and a green card holder. Those seven men are not going to be part of this exchange. And uh, in exchange, three for every one hostage, three Palestinian prisoners who are being held in Israel for various crimes have been, are being released as we speak in this swap. So we're looking right now at that happening at the crossing in Gaza, and we will, of course, continue to monitor that as we here uh, finish this half hour on This Week in South Florida right here. So back to our news of the moment. Soon after a federal court last month cleared the way for Seminole Tribe Gambling Compact with the state to go forward, the tribe announced plans for a glitzy opening in a couple of weeks with its monopoly on games like roulette and craps at its South Florida casinos. But at the center of the ongoing legal fight is the online sports betting component of that compact, which the tribe quietly relaunched while the Supreme Court of the United States decides whether to take it up. Competing local paramutuals, West Flagler Associates, are arguing that this case and that it could have nationwide implications. We invited the tribe's leadership and West Flagler's reps to the program. Hopefully they'll join us sometime soon. But to break it all down right now, Daniel Wallach is here. He's a South Florida gaming attorney and sports betting legal expert, one of our go-to people to break down what is a very complicated subject, right? So nice to have you here at the table. It's great to be back every two years. I mean, this court case or the court battles have lasted all the way back to 2021 and there's still a little bit more left to go. You know, I feel like 2021 is only two years ago, but I feel like we've been covering this for my whole career almost. But so set right now, this is a, a complicated legal structure because you have state case, you have a federal case. So kind of fill us in on where legally this stands. Okay, well, there are two different uh, court cases. Mm -hmm. There is right now, the only one that is currently pending is an original proceeding before the Florida Supreme Court. Uh, Wes Flagler is uh, alleging in that lawsuit that the legalization of online sports betting uh, by the state legislature and by Governor DeSantis violates Florida Amendment 3, which was the initiative that was enacted by the voters back in 2018, which said that if you're going to authorize or legalize casino gambling, it has to be done through a statewide referendum and, you know, by the voters. And it, and it cuts out the legislature and the governor from that process. And the argument here is sports betting is a form of casino gambling, and that while there is an exception under Amendment 3 for casino gambling on tribal lands pursuant to a compact, uh, bets being placed by patrons and customers from locations all over the state of Florida are not on tribal lands. The betting is taking place remotely from wherever the customer is located, and that's the heart of the issue. Okay, so you have the compact that was signed, and it's been in court, so now the compact was cleared by the courts. The not, com not completely not yet. Except for the app part, which we'll get right. to. So the, the compact, which includes roulette and what they call class three gaming roulette and um things like baccarat, I don't know, baccarat is in there and and craps that is not being contested by west flagler associates because that's part of the compact which is legal to do in a state on tribal lands right that that part of right. the compact anything that's on reservation yes or on tribal land gaming is considered within the scope of the indian gaming regulatory act but the compact also has provisions allowing for online sports betting right. in that so, part of the compact. Right, so let's get, so that, the compact, 2021, this was signed, this is $2.5 billion over the course of five years to the state from the tribe as, as revenue, as proceeds. And, and to your point, part of that is this new idea of doing a sports bet online with the um, stipulation that the servers are on tribal land, and so to the tribe, as long as the server, servers are on tribal land, anybody who bets, that's where they come. And this is what's under dispute, that component. So legally, is there precedent in any case to show 
that I mean it was called fantasy by one judge that's fantasy mm. because people fiction. Think she called fiction, it a fiction, fiction fiction I'm sorry to right. do an end run to use a sports term and then run around the requirements of federal law so someone in Oshkosh is placing a sports bet on the Seminole tribe app and the tribe and I suppose by default the state of Florida says oh no that's good because it's in Florida but is there precedent for finding the origination of the bet not being on tribal land or in Florida is somewhere else. Is there precedent for that? There is abundant precedent. Hmm. In fact, all the precedent lines up in favor of the gaming activity being uh, the place where the person makes the bet. In fact, the U.S. Supreme Court uh, decided a case back in 2014 uh, involving off-reservation tribal gaming and Justice Elena Kagan said that the gaming activity is the place where the bed is made, not the processing of it at a remote location, and that the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, everything about that statute, and she said literally everything, applies to gaming on Indian lands and nowhere else. And if the gaming activity, which is the operative term in IGRA, if the gaming activity is what is allowed and all that is allowed under IGRA, it's clear that the activity uh, is the placing of the bed on a mobile device and there's the Bay Mills case from the U.S. Supreme Court in 2014 as well as a sc scores of federal appeals court decisions which have held resoundingly without exception that IGRA does not apply to off-reservation tribal gaming activity a la the remotely placed sports bet. And that's at the federal level? That's at the federal level, are, yes. Are there other states where tribes are doing this? No. There are other states, however, that use the same deeming approach of declaring that a bet made outside of a permitted location somehow magically occurs at the permitted location. Examples of this are New Jersey and New York. They have state constitutions which, which restrict the locations where casino gambling can take place, and lawmakers have uh, decreed that any online wagers are made at those permitted locations, regardless of where the customer is located. But federal law is treated much differently because IGRA imposes a territorial restriction on where bets can take place, and we have the benefit of case law. Interpreting IGRA, there's a, there's a case called California versus Ipai Nation of Santa Isabel, where an Indian tribe in California attempted to operate uh, internet bingo, and the federal government filed a case, the state of California filed a case, a lawsuit challenging the ability of the tribe to do off-reservation internet gaming, and the Ninth Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals said that gaming remotely outside of Indian lands is not covered by IGRA. So it sounds like... Um, this is a layperson talking. I'm trying to, you know, understand it fully, to explain it simply. It sounds like state law and federal law may really be at odds here in this particular case. Not at odds, but you could have inconsistent results. Mm -hmm. and, and by the way, the U.S. Department of the Interior in the federal court case argued in briefs before the D.C. Circuit that the Reservate, that the bets made online occur outside of Indian lands. So one interesting uh, wrinkle here is that the federal government is siding or at least aligned with Wes Flagler's position in the state court case. But I think the common denominator here, this is a political show. People understand that politics often infuses the debate. I mean, they're often challenged. Often or always? Yeah. <laughs> okay, invariably, inevitably, Governor DeSantis is the defendant in this case, and he happened to appoint five out of the seven justices that sit on the Florida Supreme Court, and there have been 14 similar cases brought against Governor DeSantis and the Florida Supreme Court where his legal authority constitutionally has been challenged, and not one time has the court, which has predominantly been appointed by him, rebuked Governor DeSantis, so I think we can predict the result. Th not gambling cases, other cases. No, other cases, yeah. other cases, but it, it, it does show a trend that this court, or at least the current iteration of the Florida Supreme Court, is prone to defending Governor DeSantis' initiatives because may, maybe, maybe, maybe the law is right uh, on his side, but also they owe their jobs to him, and unless you oh, have a oh, Or they really think that. They might really <laughs> think that, and I'm of the belief that in order to sort of buck the convention here and be the outlier in state court, you need a slam dunk case, not a, not a case that could go either way. And I believe, at least under state law, 
maybe this is a case could go out, could, that could go either way, mm -hmm. and that might be the out for the Florida Supreme Court, but I feel completely differently about the prospects in the U.S. Supreme Court. So let, let's, I want to take a quick break. We uh, hit a commercial break. Let's talk about that when we come back. All right, stay tuned. We'll be right back. We are back with Dan Wallach, sports betting attorney. Is that is that like a title, sports betting attorney, sports, uh, I should, sports wagering attorney? I think I trademarked that one. <laughs> well, you are so well versed in the legal aspects of something that is so big right now in South Florida. And I wanted in the last segment we were talking about will the Supreme Court of the United States take this case up? And right now, Wes Flagler is is asking for that to happen, asked for an extension to ask for that to happen. Um, what what is the likelihood that the Supreme Court will take it up because it, it kind of does have national implications. Well, it is a statistical long shot. I mean, okay. if you just if you took any average, any case filed in the U.S. Supreme Court where you're asking for the court to grant cert, which is essentially to review the case all over on its merits. We don't do Latin here on okay. this week in South Florida. <laughs> <laughs> and we also probably shouldn't do too much legalese, but statistically, right. uh, that's less than a 2% likelihood. Wow. But when you have represented parties and important national issues, and you have a, a split among the federal courts of appeal below, as well as down the road repercussions. This is precisely the type of case that the U.S. Supreme Court would take, and I'll explain why. I mean, you certainly, we well, have a circuit split yeah. on the question of whether IGRA, which are compacts, whether those can include off-reservation tribal gaming activities. The D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals said yes, Every other circuit court to, to have considered the issue has said no. This decision is also in conflict with the U.S. Supreme Court's own precedent in Michigan versus Bay Mills. And then the long-term implications. This will not be the end of the road on the debate over the compactability of online wagering because if this decision holds up, tribes in other jurisdictions and states in other jurisdictions are going to uh, use the Florida Compact Blueprint to give tribes in those states the ability to operate online sports betting and iGaming and consequently it isn't just the ability to enter into that kind of gaming it's it's the road to a monopoly and Florida is going to beget California and other states and there will be lawsuits in all those other jurisdictions because invariably there are commercial casinos, there are card rooms, there are horse racetracks that stand in the same shoes as West Flagler. They're going to raise the issue in the federal courts in their circuit and that federal court will not be bound by the D.C. Circuit's decision. That has no binding precedent outside of the D.C. Circuit. So you make a really good case for this to be a go. What is the, there, one of the biggest issues is equal protection in the lawsuits. What does that mean? What, how does equal protection play in this case? Yeah, the Florida uh, lawmakers granted the Seminole tribe a monopoly. For money. Over, for money, yeah. but they granted an entitlement to the Seminole tribe based on alienage, uh, which is, could be race, religion, uh, alienage in the case of you know, tribal alienage. And our, our U.S. Constitution has um, an equal protection clause in the 14th Amendment that applies to situations where state governments grant rights to certain people, you know, create classifications where some can engage in the activity and others can't. And here, the Seminole tribe are being granted a monopoly over sports betting simply because they're a tribe. And not only can no one else engage in that activity, but it becomes a felony. You know, the, the same yeah, law upgraded right. the charges from a misdemeanor to a felony for any other person or entity to engage in that activity. And when you're talking about sex, race, religion, or alienage, that's a suspect classification that's given strict scrutiny so it's by the federal courts. It, it sounds like there's a lot here for Supreme Court justices to really dive into. So I guess we'll know um, whether they get the extension to February yeah. or, or next month. But Dan Wallach, we, we will have you back in this chair because there's a lot to understand, and I so appreciate the way you just really break down a very complicated subject. It's Thank my you. pleasure as always, Glenna. Thanks for having me on. Of course. Okay, when we come back, a Thanksgiving weekend special for you. Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School Eagles soaring in New York City's holiday parade.
that is the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, and you are watching the only band from Broward County ever selected to play in that iconic holiday parade. What a thrill for Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High's Eagle Regiment. And what a thrill for all in South Florida to see that school in front of a national audience for all the right reasons. The reason Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Band Director Steve Rivero is with us Apparently fresh off the plane. Is that true from New York City? Hi, Steve. Yes. Wow. Well, if you haven't slept yet, then we appreciate you staying up for us. So welcome back. And how did it go? It looked like it went really well. It was phenomenal. An absolute dream come true. And the, there were a lot of people there. There's like 162 people from Stoneman Douglas High, besides chaperones and parents. How, um, you know, how did you sort of corral the cats how did you get them all really on team for playing what is an iconic parade in front of a national audience it's like i said to all the families uh thanksgiving evening after everything was done none of it would it would have been possible without the assistance of everybody involved it truly takes a village as everybody knows to have something successful and we were able to just do that corral it all together and to have it culminate with an incredible production run at the end of that uh, parade was just magical. So, you know, we um, it, it's really hard. Uh, I'll just say the quiet part out loud. It's just really hard for news organizations to talk about anything at Douglas High that does not come through the lens of the catastrophe that happened there five years ago. Um, we know the families. We work with the families all the time. Um, and so watching this, there is an element of such pride and such gratitude that this school that has endured so much is now reaping such, um, such honors, really. Yeah, I mean, it, it's just that. It, it's an honor. And, uh, you know, we always try to make sure that we keep uh, both the legacies of Gina and Alex with our program. And if you zoomed in on our flag that we had, our production was, was the Polar Express, but our flag had a picture of the golden ticket on it. And then there were two names listed and it said Gina and Alex. So as we told the families and everybody else, uh, they're definitely, they were marching in Herald Square with us. Um, so for anyone who may not even be in South Florida watching, that is Gina Montalto and Max Schachter, who were two students at Douglas High, two victims. Alex Schachter. Alex, was Alex the Schachter. I'm sorry. Yes. Max Schachter, his it's dad, far. and Tony yes. Montalto, her dad, I understand, were instrumental in a lot of the funding. Uh, they were both band members um, and both victims of that massacre. Uh, and their parents have been so involved in really moving policy and moving law when it comes to gun safety, um, their legacies now, and, and they were responsible for a large part of the funding of getting the band to New York City. Yes, they were. Uh, the Montalto family and Gina's name made a donation of $17,000 before we left. That's how we were able to outfit everybody in the actual Polar Express themed costumes. Uh, as well as the flags that we had printed. And the Schachter uh, family donates uh, an annual amount every year to our program, $25,000 in the name of Alex. So you became band director there in 2019, is that right? That's correct. Um, so that was a, a year after the fact. Um, give mm -hmm. us sort of, take us inside how you deal with that and how you deal with what happened and, you know, since then, there, it's still very fresh. There are congressional and lawmaking groups going through the 1200 building before it's demolished, which is still a crime scene. Um, take us, get a little personal with us, if you would, how, you know, you're fresh to the school a year later, uh, tasked with leading the band. How, how did you, how did you maneuver that? Sure, well, you know, <clears throat> my principal, Michelle Keffert, I worked with her uh, a lot of years at Flanagan. And she was named to be the principal at Stumman Douglas. And of course, I, I went over uh, with her uh, during that time. We talked a lot with the families because I really wanted to get a chance to know everybody and at the same time be extremely sensitive to everything that had transpired. However, my son Robert is uh, not my two sons that are here. They're in the band marching. But my, my oldest son, Robert, he's another director with us at the school. Um, we talked about our philosophy of making everything about 
these students, okay, and making a lot of fun experiences. So our first year there, we were set to go to a Bands of America regional just up and back in Orlando to Orlando the same day. And we sat the students down and we said, we're not going to do that. I said, we're going to go up, we're going to compete the Bands of America regional, but then we're going to go to Walt Disney World the next day and we're going to march in the Disney parade. So just things like that <clears throat> about really trying to make them shine in a positive light and that was our, our big pledge uh, with this whole Macy's production. And that was to let the entire world know about the great amount of talent that there is at Stoneman Douglas High School and all the positivity that this school should be known for. And we're just gonna continue forward with our mission, uh, again, to shine this positive light on this incredible school and these incredible students in this community. So now, uh, five years later, there has been a turnover. High school is four years, so there's been a turnover of students. So I'm guessing there's no there's no one in the band that was there in 2018, right? No. However, you know the, the neighboring middle schools they they were part of it. We have siblings now that are in the program of students that were taken uh, during the tragedy, and uh, you know either way, we're on a pursuit to move forward. But at the same time, we're not going to leave that legacy behind and we're going to continue to do things uh, to honor them. Do they, do, do you talk about that with the students? Do they play with a little bit of extra heart and soul because of that, do you think? Yeah, absolutely, I do. And every year at our banquet, since uh, we arrived there at Summit Douglas in 2019, we instituted two awards and both in the name of Gina and Alex. Uh, Gina's is the spirit uh, of uh, Color, Guard, the Color Guard Award because she was in the Color Guard and Alex is the spirit of Music Award. And we give that out and the families both come to our banquet uh, every single year and they join us in presenting the award to a new student every single year. So your sons that are there with you played in the band. You yes. Wanna, you want to you wanna stick them in front of the camera there and let, let us hear from them. We hear this is Austin the show. Guerrero. Austin's a senior. Hi Austin. Hi, nice to meet you. How was it? Thanks. Um, how how did that go? What do you play? And and take us take us onto Herald Square. What was that like? Well, I'm a piano player originally, but in the show I was the conductor as the Polar Express because that was our theme. So I was just walking around saying hi and quoting around my golden ticket. Oh, so you had the easy part. Yes, I, did. <laughs> I had the easiest part. Thank you. Lord. And what's your brother's name? This is Aiden. Hi, Aiden. Hi. How How'd it go you? for you? What do you play? Um, I play percussion. And in the parade, I was pushing the banner. So you kept the beat? Well, not, not necessarily in the parade, but he was pushing the big banner. He was one of the five oh, that was pushing oh, oh, the big right. banner for the parade. Right. So this was, you know, bands, I guess people who aren't really thinking too hard about what you do, you didn't even play music alone. You actually performed and danced and choreographed, and it's, it's hard. I've been there. Yeah. It's hard. <laughs> so listen, it's so great to have you all. Big congratulations to you and the whole school and what you achieved and what you're going to achieve. And you know, we're all right there with you. Yeah, we appreciate the outpouring of support from everybody. It's been wonderful for the, our students and again, wonderful for, for our community. That's awesome. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, everyone. We will be right back. Watch today's interviews or listen to the This Week in South Florida podcast. Just scan that QR code right there with your phone and it takes you right to the This Week in South Florida section of Local10.com. We want to hear from you. Thoughts, input about anything in the news. Love to hear from you and you can connect easily via email or social media at Glenna WPLG. That's Facebook, X, Twitter, Instagram, threads, whatever you're on. Thank you so much for being here with us. Have a beautiful Sunday and remember, keep in touch.